Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. We cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest talking about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Um, now, before we get started, just a couple little announcements. Um, Totem, the target of the month, you have about five days or so left uh, to get those entries in uh, if you're shooting the Seahorse Nebula. So go ahead and I've already seen some of your images come through. So good looking stuff. Uh, but we have a couple days left for target of the month. For those of you who participated last month, um, there were very few of you, but those patches are shipping today. So uh, you should start seeing those patches come through next week. Now, um, one other thing, if you like what you see here on the channel, please go ahead and subscribe and leave a like on the videos. It lets us know we're doing a good job and that we should actually keep doing it. Um, and then finally, if you want to support the channel a little bit further, we do have our, like we say every time, skywatcher.threadless.com. You can go over there and get all kinds of cool shirts and stuff to help match with your products um, or just have something cool. So uh, there's the Seahorse Nebula right there. Um, but yeah, so that's just a couple little announcements today. Um, so it is the end of the month. It is August 25th, 2023. That is when this episode aired. Um, as with most of our episodes, they are live and they are pre-recorded. They are recorded. Um, so you can go back and watch them if you weren't able to join us live. Um, but today we have a good friend of ours who's back uh, to talk space. Um, he's the only person I know who's been to space. So he trumps all of us with that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce Don. Don is joining us from Texas today. Good morning, Don. Good morning. Or yeah, it's it just switched to noon time here, but it's morning other places. Because you're in Houston, right? Yeah, I'm in Houston, and uh, it's not uh, Phoenix hot, but for Houston, it is hot now. And I've seen the weather advisories for that region. You guys are getting toasty in that area yeah we're we're getting toasted a little hotter you know 95 is a good kind of summertime houston temperature and it's been going over 105 so uh, 10 degrees makes a big difference well unlike here in phoenix you guys actually have humidity which is a yeah, whole yeah. other can of worms yeah it, it, and and it, it'll be 90 degrees in the morning 100 percent humidity yeah so it's been a little while since we've had you on, um, and I figured we'd catch up and see what you're doing. I know NASA's been really busy with a lot of stuff over the last couple of years. You know, I, and Artemis being one of the big topics of conversation. Um, but I didn't know if you could elaborate a little bit on what's going on with the projects that are going on at NASA. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. We have more going on in terms of programs at NASA now than I think we ever had had in the past. We've got Space Station is going strong. And as a part of Space Station, we have the commercial space program. And that involves uh, SpaceX, uh, Dragon vehicles, and soon we'll have the Boeing uh, Starliner a vehicle. So we'll have those two commercial vehicles uh, going to station, and then we will, uh, those will be crewed vehicles, and then we continue to have, have commercial cargo vehicles. We have the SpaceX Dragon cargo vehicle. We have Northrop Grumman a Cygnus cargo vehicle. We have the, the JAXA HTV cargo vehicle, and then we're also working with Sierra Aerospace on their version of a cargo vehicle, which incidentally looks like a miniature shuttle and it lands on a runway like a shuttle instead of mm. uh, uh, coming down as a capsule. So that's the space station program with all the commercial aspect. Now, if you look at Artemis, it's a multifaceted program because part of it involves uh, SLS, the the big uh, booster, which is basically a Saturn V remake, although it doesn't look like Saturn V. And then the Orion uh, capsule on that, along with the exploration upper stage, which gives it the, the uh, capability to go away from planet Earth. And, and so we're working on that. Uh, then 
we're working on uh, lunar landers. We've got two different versions of lunar landers that we're working on contract right now, uh, one with SpaceX and one with Blue Origin. And then we have Gateway, which is, a, think of it as a smallish space station that will be crew tended, not uh, crewed all the time. It'll be crew tended and it'll be a, a, a waypoint to rendezvous with your lunar lander vehicle and then, then go down to the surface of the moon. And then we've got uh, lunar surface programs dealing with cargo, uncrewed cargo vehicles landing multi-tons on the surface of the moon so that they could be uh, utilized by the, the, the crewed uh, versions along with sensors and, and other measurement techniques to, to help guide the landing phase. And then we've got a, uh, a new spacesuit under construction. Uh, we need a surface space suit, and and it it's had a number of different names. Uh, the name that that I remember most is it's called XEMU, and then and we've got uh, at least two commercial providers that are working on their own deltas to the XEMU surface suit, and then we are working on pressurized and unpressurized rovers for, for lunar missions. And, and we're working on both kinds of those rovers. So, so that's kind of the gamut of, of what is happening at NASA. And it's, this is a hopping place. We've never had that kind of, of, uh, of uh, that, that number of programs all being worked at the same time. It's, it, it's really fun to be here. That's, I think that's the interesting part is a lot from, I didn't even know about half of that, but it all makes sense when you stop to think about it, because I think in the public eye, it's just like, oh, Artemis or the capsules, or you yeah. just see the main thing, but there's so many other parts that have to yeah. go that you don't even think about. So Yeah. And, and, and a lot of these piece parts, we either have to make something new because our existing equipment doesn't work right. And for example, our spacesuit, uh, our current EMU, uh, and NASA has all these acronyms, and after a while, the acronym just becomes a proper name, and then I forget what the acronym actually stands for, which act which becomes irrelevant. And EMU, I can't even remember what the the proper terms are for that, but it's it's our spacesuit, and the the EMU is meant for microgravity. Uh, operating in a space station environment, and it absolutely will not work on the surface of the moon because you you have no uh, leg mobility because you don't really need your legs so much when you're you're in microgravity. And and we're working on a a totally new spacesuit concept that'll have more mobility than what the Apollo uh, spacesuits had. That's pretty cool. Um, I take it because you work in Houston and it seems like all the astronauts are kind of a woven team that, you know, all the SLS, you know, crews that have been picked for the lunar missions and stuff like that as well. So. Yeah. And, and currently we only have one crew uh, for the first crewed Artemis mission, which is going to be Artemis two. And there's, there's four crew members and, and everybody knows their names because NASA has been, uh, been uh, talking about them a lot and they've been making public appearances, but they're starting to get into some pretty detailed training now for the Artemis two mission, which is going to be kind of like a, an Apollo eight mission where, where you, where you go to the moon, but you don't have a landing vehicle, and then you you come back to Earth, and and it'll be the f kind of the first phase of checking out your spacecraft and making sure everything is is going to be uh, operating. Plus, it'll give us the the opportunity to swing by the moon and test out all our uh, uh, navigation. Our uh, think about it, interplanetary navigation. We're going to have to do that again. That's pretty neat. So I know with the astronauts at NASA, such as yourself, obviously, you know, if you are on a mission or you're always training for missions and stuff like that, but what is like the day-to-day -day look like for 
say someone in your position because obviously you're not in space all the time but you're obviously full-time employed so yeah we uh we probably spend 40 percent of our time just keeping our trained skills current and this this involves simulator runs for whatever spacecraft we happen to be working on at the time and we've got now i think four simulators for the orion spacecraft and the simulators we used to have for the space shuttle are now in museums where they they should be uh but uh, but we've got simulators set up for for how to fly and do the orbital dynamics for the orion spacecraft so so we spend time training in these simulators and then then we we fly the t-38 uh uh high performance uh a military training aircraft and that is for space flight readiness training because you could be in a simulator and if if it doesn't go well you push the reset button and the crew's alive and and life support works and all of that and you could try it again which is sort of the whole purpose of why you simulate and and why you trade so much so that you can learn through your failures but at a T-38, it's a highly dynamic platform. You've got a real pound of flesh in there. And, and uh, uh, you know, mistakes are real costly in, in, in that kind of situation. And it adds a, a sweat on your palm uh, nature that you don't have when you're in a, a, a simulator. So, so the, the T-38 program for spaceflight readiness training and our simulators, those two together, do a really good job of getting us trained up for a mission. I have to imagine that you probably enjoy the T-38 flight times. Yeah, it, it comes with a huge obligation though. We, uh, we, we have to do instrument check rides. We've got to do exams. I, I have to do a written exam that is like 125 questions uh, once a year, all dealing with the intricacies of the systems on the jet and uh, the rules and regulations for flying IFR uh, airspace in 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 America, and and it, it's it's a big responsibility to fly in one of these aids. It isn't like yep yep let's go jump in a jet and have a good time. Uh, mm -hmm. We spend at least an hour uh, on a pre-brief for every flight. Uh, we walk, we fly our sortie, we come back, we do a debrief, and you get used to uh, talking about all the things that you screwed up, you know, minor things, but but you you have to go through this process in order to get better. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to realize you're going to make a mistake, and you have a crew of two in this aircraft, so if you make a small mistake, your other crew member can catch it, and you're working together as a team, and then when you're done, you do a debrief, and then you write your notes and you study those before your next one. Nice. Uh, there is a question here that came up. Um, what would be the expected duration of the stay on the moon for the first Artemis landing? Okay. Um, the total mission is probably going to be around 30 days, maybe 35 days. The actual stay on the moon for the Artemis three mission uh, which is currently by the plan going to be the the la the first landing mission that's going to be a six and a half day stay on the surface of the moon and three day was the longest for apollo and our first mission out of the chalks is at least planned for six and a half days and what makes it a a 30-day mission is because of delta v constraints and that we're going to the South Pole region of the moon, which takes a little more Delta V to get there than going to an equatorial region, which Apollo missions all went to. It's taking us five days to get to the moon instead of three days, what the Apollo mission did. And so, so five days to get there, five days to come back, that's 10 days right there. Then you're gonna have to phase your orbit on the moon so that you can land in the South Pole region. And, and people don't realize how tough it is to, to land in the South Pole region area, as we've just found out with the last two spacecraft. And, and kudos to the Indian team for, for, for pulling off the, the landing mission. Uh, and then 
and then uh, six days, six and a half days on the moon, and then you got to do phasing to come back, and then another five days to come back to Earth. It, it total mission will be somewhere around thirty days. Hmm. It's a lot longer than I thought it was actually, but it makes sense because with Apollo, it's like you launch, you fling around the Earth a couple times, slingshot, go the moon catches you, and you do your thing. Where here, it's like you have to then adjust your orbit. Yeah, you, you're yeah, you need a 90 degree uh, uh, phase angle change, which uh, can cost you dearly in Delta V if you don't do it right. And then uh, we'll do lunar rendezvous with the landing craft, which is something that Apollo didn't have to do. So we, so the lunar lander will already be pre in place in orbit around the moon and uh, Artemis spacecraft will have to catch up to it and dock. And initially, Gateway will not be there. Uh, the, the, the space station orbiting the moon will not be there. And, and we'll just go a direct rendezvous to the lunar lander. But then as soon as the Gateway is in place, then we will uh, uh, go and rendezvous with Gateway, the lunar lander will be there at gateway we could use the gateway to help get things ready and and add robustness to the lunar mission and then we'll get in the, the lander and, and go to the south pole region of the moon um another question that's kind of relevant to what we're talking about anyway um will this mission be looking for different phenomena than the current indian mission um i i am not uh, really knowledgeable about all this, all the the parameters that the Indian mission is going to measure, uh, but certainly things that are of high importance for the Artemis missions. We're we're going to the South Pole region for lunar volatiles, and uh, the, there are permanently shaded regions there, uh, the bottoms of craters that that never see the light of day, uh, and there. Temperatures are around 50 Kelvin. And so they freeze out any volatiles that might happen to be around from uh, passes with comets and things like that. And, and NASA's already verified that there's uh, millions of metric tons of volatiles on the moon uh, distributed between the North and the South Pole uh, cratered regions. And so we're going to the South Pole region. We're gonna look at these permanently shadowed regions and we really want the initial media uh, uh, missions will be sampling and figuring out what exactly the content of the volatiles will be. Uh, we've got an idea from, from uh, uh, one of the probes that we crashed into the Cabayas and did spectroscopy on the, the volatile plume that came up. And not only is there confirmed water, but also a bunch of uh, low molecular weight organics. So th there, there may be a lot of uh, useful resources that we can get on the moon. And, and the, the early Artemis missions will be there to characterize the resources. Uh, the, the, the uncrewed landing missions will be to support those. And then uh, the the lunar base and the processing capability for in situ resource utilization will follow. It's a whole lot of stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a whole lot of stuff, starting with just rebuilding the technology required to get there and come back and still have a smile on your face. Yeah. Now you've been to space station three times and you've trained for that and you've been up there and spent considerable amount of time up there. What do you find the differences are between training for station and training for like Artemis? Um, when in, in station, you're training to go someplace that you're gonna call home for six months. And, and we're now starting to get one year missions to station and, and that's a different mindset than if you're going to be gone on something that's more like an extended camping trip, like a, a 30 day mission to the moon. So, so it's, it's a completely different mindset when you're going to be gone that length of time. And you have to 
you have to pace yourself on a six month mission. You can't work as hard on a six month mission as say a 10 day shuttle mission. You, you can, you can go for 16 hours a day, grab, uh, you know, uh, four hours of sleep and get going the next day. And you could do that for a week. If you're on a shuttle flight, you can't do that. If you're going to be working for, for uh, six months, uh, on, on the space station. So, so that, that's one of the, the, the glaring differences is the, is the, the, the mindset and then the kind of equipment you're working with, uh, uh, Orion spacecraft, it, it's a smallish spacecraft compared to like the space shuttle and, and you've got limited, uh, a volume, limited mass, and limited equipment that you can work and train with. So on space station, it's an orbiting laboratory, and there's literally hundreds of different uh, pieces of equipment and experiments going on, and, and there's a, a lot of training involved with staying uh, 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 current on, on how, to use, how to use the equipment on station. Um. What is something when you're on station, because I know you've been up there for a while, that you find, what's the most challenging thing for you when you're on station? Oh, well, let me break that into two parts. One, you have your programmatic duties and, and crew go to space station to do, to work the program. You know, we're not up there just as tourists to lollygag around. We're going up there and we work and we're currently scheduled for 12 hours of day of, uh, of work on space station. And out of that 12 hours, we can typically get six and a half hours of focused work on the mission. And, and I could talk a little bit more about why only six and a half if we're actively working for 12 hours. And it's the same kind of thing when, when I was working in Antarctica for one of the summers, we were out on the ice about 200 miles from the South Pole gathering meteorites for the ANZMET team. And we would work about 12 hours a day in terms of act, being active, awake, working, but we would only be out on the ice for about six hours a day. And the, the rest of the time you're doing maintenance on your snowmobiles, you're trying to figure out how to melt ice to get water, you're taking, you're drying out your clothes, you're doing all this ancillary stuff required so that you can stay alive in this Antarctic environment. And it's the same kind of thing on station where we spend six, six and a half hours focused work on uh, the what we're supposed to be doing on station and the rest of the 12 hours, sometimes 13 hours, is just doing the stuff to keep the spacecraft to, uh, uh, in orbit. That's the programmatic aspect of working and staying versed on the timeline is probably the most difficult part of the programmatic work because because they they have a little red line that marches through your day and you're supposed to stay with that red line and 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 there's there's no time off to go uh take a bio break and you have to figure out how to get one of those in there if your bladder starts to get full and that's probably the most taxing aspect of doing the programmatic work on station and then uh uh the off-duty work, it, the, the fun part of that for me is doing uh, astrophotography, doing amateur astronomy on space station. It's a wonderful, unique platform in which to make observations of Earth and beyond Earth. And, and, and so w when I'm not doing programmatic work, I'm, I'm typically doing that. Yeah, because the picture behind you is your shot. So... Yeah, this is... This is the equivalent, uh, and I'll sc slide over here. This is the equivalent of a star trail picture that all us amateur astronomers here are used to doing. And you'll put your camera on a tripod. Maybe you'll have the North Pole in the field of view, and you take a long enough time exposure, and you'll see the stars going around in circles around the North Pole because of Earth's rotation. And that's all different when you are in orbit. What you're seeing here in terms of the stars going in circles, that's not the North Pole. That's not the axis of rotation of Earth. 
that has to do with the pitch axis of station. Because if you, uh, oh, I could use this bottle of hand sanitizer. If this is station and here is earth and we're going around, uh, currently the same side points towards earth as you go around. So that means station makes one axis, one rotation about its pitch axis for every orbit around earth. And it's that pitch axis motion that makes the stars that you see behind me in this time exposure uh, rotate in an arc. And, but the, the center of that arc is the pitch axis of station doesn't have anything to do uh, with Earth per se. And, and that exposure represents about a, a, a 25 minute exposure oh, wow. uh, taken as a series of 30 second exposures and then stacked using uh, some of our favorite software. And you can also see, let's see if I can get my finger pointing here, right, right there where my thumb is, that is the atmosphere on edge. And that, that scale height is about 120 kilometers. And, and then above that, that uh, this, this is the F region of the atmosphere. It's about uh, 300 to four, 400 kilometer altitude. Station is at 400 kilometers. So we are flying right through the middle of the red, looking down at the atmosphere or through the atmosphere. And then the streaks on the surface are, are cities. And then you can see, this is actually a little bit of an oops. Right there is a, a reflection from one of the, the, the instrument lights that's in the, the cupola module on station. And you really have to be careful not to get stray light reflections uh, when you're doing these time exposures. Mm -hmm. uh, got a couple questions here regarding your astrophotography. Um, are there images you're hoping to get on your next trip whenever the mission? Oh is yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, I've got, I, I want to continue these star trail pictures, but I want to photo document the change in, uh, earth city lighting, you know, you call it light pollution, but uh, the cities, particularly in, in Asia, are switching more to LED lighting. And of course, that's a bane for amateur astronomers because sodium lighting, at least you had, uh, you could get rid of a lot of that with line filters. And you really have to be clever to try to get rid of the broader band uh, uh, spectrum from the LED lightings. And, and you get all these pastel colors that from an orbit perspective are really beautiful, but from an amateur astronomy point of view uh, is a little bit aggravating. And let, let's see, uh, maybe I could get one of my uh, helpers here to put on another star trail that the one that the, the multicolored one that, that shows the LED lighting. Uh, let's see if, if you could uh, find that one. It, it's, uh, uh, if you could find one that, that looks like it has a bunch of pastel colors in it, uh, uh, bring it up behind me because that shows the effect of LED lighting. Uh, and I'm, I keep scrolling up on, on uh, I, uh, uh, let's see, I keep scrolling. Okay, I guess, I guess we don't have that here, uh, but it's uh, it, it, the, the multicolored nature of LED lighting is starting to show up a lot. Uh, uh, when you look at orbit, and I'm I'm hoping to at least uh, photo document to that extent. Um, the next question: uh, What sort of imaging equipment do you have access to in order to do astrophotography? Okay, oh, we have the whatever the standard uh, photography suite is on station is what the crew uses. Currently, we're using Nikon D5 cameras with all the the F mount lenses and we have f-mount lenses going from 1200 millimeter telephoto lenses uh, all the way down to uh, uh, six uh, uh, the, the the eight millimeter uh, full frame fisheye uh, lens and and some of the telephoto lenses will will have the 
the the 400 millimeter and the 600 millimeter the you know f2.8 uh so the, these are big hunks of glass they they uh they're they're basically a refractive telescope uh, uh and 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 what i did last time was uh use those basically as a telescope to do solar astronomy and uh next mission i'll i'll continue to do the same thing uh, we are also in terms of upgrading camera equipment we are moving to mirrorless cameras and right now we're still in the process of evaluating what mirrorless camera system we're going to have not only on station but whatever we choose on station will also be the artemis camera system that will take to the surface of the moon that'd be cool um another question if you were to go back uh what kind of equipment would you want to take with you oh um what we have available now that wasn't available 10 years ago when i was on station and that's really fast wide angle lenses and and i'm a i'm a wide angle kind of person i like wide angle astrophotography and and i think the kind of views that you see behind me whether they're time exposures or individual frames uh, this is truly unique from an astronaut point of view uh, to get uh, the limb of the earth and a wide angle view of uh, of the space around earth uh, our satellite systems are not optimized for doing that. They tend to look nader and they tend to look more like a telephoto view. And so I like I like the wide angle oblique views, uh, both daytime and nighttime. And the wide angle lens is the fastest wide angle lens I had available last time was a 24 millimeter F 1.4. And we had 14 millimeter f2.8 but that's four times slower four times less light than a 1.4 and now uh there are wide angle truly wide angle lenses available the there's a 14 millimeter f1.4 lens available and 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 i'm i'm hoping uh, next time i go back to station that uh that lens is going to be on orbit um uh, what targets would you hope to shoot if you were up there <laughs> well whatever target of opportunity uh uh i'll bring a solar filter a broadband solar filter and i did that last time and a target of opportunity was the transit of venus and think about uh, uh that kind of target of opportunity won't be available now for like another 98 years so so it'll be a while before somebody can repeat that. So that's just an example of a target of opportunity. I was on station two times for a total solar eclipse. And you could, you don't look at the sun, you look at earth and the shadow and you see the umbra and the penumbra of the total eclipse as it, as it is projected onto earth that you, you take advantage of, of whatever natural phenomenon happened to be there at the time, uh, plus the unique observation. Uh, uh, Comet Lovejoy was uh, was there, uh, uh, became visible right on my launch day uh, for my last mission. And so so any kind of comet, comets, uh, uh, extraordinary uh, auroras, if, if you happen to be on station uh, close to solar max you're going to have more upper atmospheric phenomenon that you could see so any and all of that uh would would certainly be uh fun and interesting uh targets uh that i would uh look at uh, while i'm on on station that's one of my favorite things of hanging out with you in person is you're the last person anyone needs to get into check out my picture conversation yeah. because it's yeah. like every time it's like hey don check this out and then you're like oh that's cool and then you pull something up on your phone and it's just you, forget it just forget it like don tops it all because you're doing it from space um there there was um oh this one's actually relevant to that uh comment as well um having seen the universe from the iss is terrestrial astronomy still satisfying for you oh yes i i and I'm going to put a plug in for the atmospheric conditions in Houston. Like right now, 105 degrees uh, uh, during the day, 
90 degrees at night, 100% humidity. If you can keep the lenses of your telescope from doing up, um, you get these stable uh, atmospheric conditions that some of the best seeing I have ever had has been in the summertime, uh, Houston, in my driveway, 23 feet above sea level. Better than when I was in graduate school at Tucson. Better than when I was uh, at uh, Los Alamos at 8,000 feet uh, in New Mexico. Uh, it, it's amazing how calm and how good the scene can be in Houston, with the exception of a light pollution. So that means when, when in Houston or when in Rome, you do as a Roman. So when in Houston, you do as a Houstonians, uh, at least the amateur astronomer ones. And I focus on lunar observation and planetary observation. And the light pollution isn't so big of a deal for, for that. And, and I've, I've got some, uh, some of the best imagery I've done of the moon and of the planets right on my driveway. And, and it never gets tiring. Uh, the, the only thing that, that gets tiring is uh, going to work the next day and doing training if you've been up for half the night. But I think all the amateur astronomers are, are used to that. And that brings up some interesting stuff because I know we've done an episode on this for anybody who doesn't know. There is a difference between seeing conditions and darkness. So um dawn's in a really unique spot of the country very similar to like the florida keys where the winter star party is where you get these onshore flows because of the moisture that's coming off the ocean it makes the air very thick so it doesn't move quickly which makes it very stable for high power planetary and lunar and solar work um however from the deep sky perspective obviously that's it's houston it's like any other major city the light pollution sucks so it's just yeah yeah, and, and, another, and another example, Kevin, is Chris Goh, who is probably the foremost uh, amateur astronomer for imaging Jupiter. And he lives in the Manila area of the Philippines. You know, again, right at sea level, lots of light pollution, uh, thick, high humidity. Uh, yet he has some of the, the best imagery of, of Jupiter that I've ever seen. We just had him on a month ago as our guest. Oh, cool. Um, Is he so, still doing okay? It's been a couple of years since I've yeah, talked to him. Yeah, he just got an upgraded C14. He's all stoked about it. But we went through his whole, if you actually want to go back and watch it, you might find it interesting. We went through his whole updated processing for planetary work. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Last time I was at Neef, uh, he was talking and, and he gave his workflow for doing Jupiter uh, imagery. And, and the room was packed with people and pencils and paper, and they were writing down all his pearls of wisdom. He's yeah. he's an amazing fellow. Yes, he is. And very humble, especially for what he does. Yeah. And I uh, think, I, yeah, yeah. Go, go oh, on. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, how do you mount a telescope, and how do you compensate for rotation of spacecraft, or do you just limit the exposure time on a short exposure? Okay. Up uh, on, on my... Uh, uh, three missions that I've been to space station. My first mission was during construction phase of station, and we didn't fly uh, with the same phase of station facing Earth as you go around. We flew what was a, a solar inertial orbit. So, so if here's Earth, we would fly like this with the solar panels pointing towards the sun oh, and that was because we were in a power uh, uh, a low power uh, regime because we only had like one eighth of the solar one eighth of the the power on station at that time and and we needed to fly in the solar inertial attitude and Skylab by the way also flew in a solar inertial attitude it could go into this uh, 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 local vertical attitude like we're currently going on station, but uh, but um, for much of its mission, it flew flew this solar inertial attitude. And if you look at a solar inertial attitude, where the jelly side of the solar panels point towards uh, the sun as you orbit Earth, it differs from a stellar inertial attitude by about one degree a day. And so now the whole space station itself 
is a tracking platform. So some of the best uh, wide field uh, astrophotography uh, I have done was from my first mission because the whole space station acted as a tracking platform. And then, then uh, uh, since then station is doing this local vertical attitude and, and because the pitch rate uh, uh, because of the pitch rate with, uh, say, a 14 millimeter to 24 millimeter lens, you can't do an exposure more than about a second, maybe two seconds without seeing significant blur on the stars. And, and so and, and there, there's no tracking mechanism on station that allows you to, to track on that, which is something that that uh, 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 if I get to fly again, I'm going to be bringing some kind of a tracker with me uh, so that I can uh, compensate for the pitch rate of station. And then I can uh, once again, make long-ish time exposures of, uh, of star fields. Nice. Um, another question, uh, why use a DSLR? Why not use a specialty uh, cooled astronomy camera? Um, <laughs> Because there are none of those cameras on the space station. Uh, NASA provides the cameras for uh, basically engineering use. And then, uh, and we we take hundreds, if not thousands, of just engineering pictures, pe pictures of clung filters and pictures of bent pins in electrical connectors and things like that. Uh, and then we also use the cameras for Earth observation. And then uh, crew can use the cameras for anything else that they that they they want to use the cameras for. And in my case, I use them for amateur astronomy. But there's no amateur astronomy program on space station. So we don't have any of the of the uh, like the the monochrome uh, ZWO kind of cameras. Uh, that are cooled and 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 all of that. We 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 just have the 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 single lens reflex cameras and soon uh, some form of a of a mirrorless camera. And and then we, you have to make do with you have to make do with with uh, with those uh, those cameras on on station. Well, I know we've talked about this before. It's pretty much anything that goes to station has to be approved through a pretty it vicious does. process. So, yeah. And, and so uh, for, for example, I, I just can't shove a, a monochrome uh, uh, astronaut, uh, amateur astronomy optimized camera. Uh, I just can't shove that in my pocket and, and, and fly it up to station. All these things have to go through testing. They have to go through flammability. They have to go through degassing because you, you're living in a, in a closed, a uh, hundred percent recycled, uh, or or close to a hundred percent recycled uh, environment, and if something burps off and that nasty gas or something like that, maybe our scrubbers won't actually take that gas out. We we have some instances of things like that happening, and 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 so it has to go through not only the safety reviews. Uh, but then they typically go through functionality tests because there's a lot of galactic cosmic rays and other things that can can either damage the equipment or or cause it to to lock up and not work. So, so uh, it's it's a little more complicated than than just saying, hey, let's let's fly a new piece of electronics. Uh, it it's a it's a bigger deal than 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 what most people uh think it should be uh just because of of the environment that you're you're working in and and i i wish i could take a a, a monochrome uh, optimized uh, thermal electric cooled camera but but uh i i'll i'll make do with whatever camera system we have on station yeah i know you were saying that you guys use the nikon d5s and you had mentioned that cosmic rays are a problem and those the lifespan of those cameras eventually gets wiped out because of yeah. constant cosmic rays. Yeah, we replace the D5s about once a year. And after a year, the, the chip is so filled with cosmic ray uh, damage. And it typically, instead of making a pixel black, it typically makes it scream, uh, 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 
scream a full, you know, 255, uh, actually the four bit, uh, the 14 bit equivalent of that. And, and so you have all these bright white spots sprinkled through your pictures. And if it's a, a nighttime image, it, it, it really distracts. And if you do the in-camera noise reduction, it doubles your, uh, the length of time that you can, can go back and take a follow-up picture. And, and, and so uh, for, for some kinds of amateur astronomy, uh, you, you can't do in-camera noise reduction. You just have to uh, do your own dark frames and then flat fields, and then you can, you can calibrate your images after the fact. And, and we, we, get, we change out the cameras about once a year. Um, I know I know the answer. I don't know if other people do, and I don't know if you can even elaborate on What do you do when the cameras are toast? Okay, uh, because of up mass and down mass, we actually have more up mass than we have down mass because of the, the cargo vehicles. Of the cargo vehicles, only one right now returns payload to Earth, and the other four cargo vehicles burn up in the atmosphere. And, and the return cargo is typically highly prized things like the, the samples from experiments that have been going on space station or, or uh, uh, hard to replace parts like parts from our space suits and things like that, which need to go down to ground for refurbishment and then they get launched again and sure. so the the down mass is typically reserved for that and if you have something like a camera body uh, you can't justify the 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 down mass allocation for flying a, a worn out uh, cosmic ray shot camera body so we put them in a vehicle that, that gets burned up in the atmosphere and it kind of pains you to take and we'll change out about 10 cameras at a time. So, uh, so 10, if you happen to be Nikon the crew, flagship it, cameras. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you happen to be that crew, you may be tasked with putting eight to 10 Nikon D fives in a vehicle that's going to burn up. But the happy thing is that vehicle probably brought up eight to 10 new D fives. And I also want to point out that by the time we burn a D five up, it has between 300,000 and 400,000 cycles on the shutter. So, yeah. so these are high mileage cameras that uh, with, a, with a shot uh, 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 detector uh, filled with cosmic ray damage. Uh, they're, uh, apart from they've flown in space, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't even buy one of these things off of eBay if, if you knew that the camera had that kind of mileage on it. So, yeah. so we just burn them up and fly new ones. There you go. Um, I know we got a couple questions left. We're getting to the last few minutes. Um, are you allowed to bring any of your own equipment to station? Yeah, so we can, every crew, can bring up a small bag of personal effects. And this bag is about like that, you know? It's, it's, it's about like a, a, a large purse, you know? It's smaller than most carry-on bags. And you can put whatever you want in this bag so long as it passes NASA safety review. And, and you know, most people put stuff in it like banners from their university and, and you know, uh, pieces of jewelry for their family and friends and things like that. And I fill my bag up full of amateur astronomy equipment that will pass safety inspection. So uh, that and, and other little things that might be useful for doing educational demonstrations on station. So, so I, don't, I don't waste any, any crew personal items on a banner from your university or anything like that. Uh, I, I put what I think uh, are uh, items that I could do meaningful educational demonstrations on on station. It's like you should take a meteorite fragment one day up and just say I returned it. So oh, like... I, I did that uh, on STS 126. I took I I got uh, I, as a scientist I I checked out a sample of the burden Jolie meteorite and i'm probably not pronouncing that correctly it's uh it's a meteorite uh a con chondrite uh 
a meteorite that, that landed in, I believe, Norway, one of the Scandinavian countries. And the thing about it, it, was, it had chondrules that were maybe one to three millimeter diameter chondrules that were just falling out from this meteorite. And I flew uh, a small bag of those chondrules with me to see whether they would uh, naturally agglomerate in a weightless environment. And then I flew all the, after making the observation and I got two papers published on that, uh, peer reviewed papers. Uh, then uh, the, those uh, uh, chondrules were uh, uh, flown back to earth and then I returned them to the Smithsonian collection. So there's been at least one uh, a meteorite sample that's made uh, a couple of round trips, at, l at least one round trip through through Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> return to sender. Um, yeah, return you, to sender. <laughs> are you able to process your images right on the ISS, or did you wait to get back on Earth? Uh, we used to be able to do that, and with so much of the image processing software requiring real-time uh uh, internet connections for verification and all of that. It, uh, I'm, uh, you know, we're working trying to figure out how can we get real image processing software that will work in the orbiting environment, a space station that doesn't necessarily have real time internet access. And, uh, but, but on my past missions, uh, I used Adobe Photoshop. It was CS6 which I believe is the last standalone version that would operate. And I would use it to review and do a small amount of image processing as a test to make sure that my primary data collection for imagery was okay. But uh, a time on station is too valuable to spend time uh, spending hours and hours doing image processing. Uh, I'd rather spend, if I have that time, I'd rather spend it uh, collecting more images and then you could do the processing on the ground. But you do want to look at your pictures hard enough and long enough to make sure that the stacking will work, that the exposures are okay, that the cosmic ray damage is not, uh, 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 is is not too bad uh, you could do the dark current subtractions you could do the calibration so so i did just enough to verify that the images i was taking were the best i could and then i'd spend the rest of my time getting more imagery yet done nice um and i know right now you're doing training you're you're always doing training as yeah an we're, we're always training like i say uh, before in your question, which I didn't completely answer, uh, uh, active astronauts spend about 40% of your time just keeping up the basic skills you need in order to call yourself an astronaut. And the other 60% of the time, you do some form of a ground job. And right now, nearly everyone in the office, their ground job is focused on Artemis, uh, uh, mission uh, work where where we're doing evaluations like how big should a window be in a hatch so that if you have a crew member on one side uh, maybe doing a, a spacewalk and crew members on the other side and you have a calm outage you could use hand signals to communicate uh, uh, from outside to inside through the hatch window and what's the smallest acceptable window diameter that you can have in a hatch and still be effective at doing communication. And, and that's an example where, where astronauts would spend a couple of days uh, in spacesuits with a little, uh, a little hatch mechanism in front of them, looking at the window with another astronaut on the other side, and we'd be trying to use hand signals to communicate. And then they start off with a big window and it sequentially gets smaller and smaller and smaller until uh, you can't do your communication anymore. And then the, the minimum acceptable size is useful data for the engineers when they go ahead and, and do the spacecraft design. So that's, that's an example of, of how astronauts, active astronauts would be spending the other 60% of their time when they're not specifically training for the skills required for a mission. Um, last question, then we'll 
uh, let you go. Um, if and when you go back up, what's what are you looking forward to the most? Well, I'm looking forward to the most of uh, just living in space. I, I come alive when I'm on orbit. It's like my home away from home. And, and I really enjoy living and working in space. I will enjoy doing the mission work. Uh, and then I'll, and I'll also enjoy the off-duty time where I can continue my amateur astronomy and other educational uh, science-based demonstrations. Very good. Well, Don, I know you have a real uh, busy schedule, and I appreciate you taking the hour to hang out with us this morning. I know by on behalf of the whole Skywatcher crew, we really appreciate you coming back on, and I know we always love having you on. So hopefully we cross paths in person here in the not-so-distant future. So. Yes. Yeah, I understand there's a, a, a couple of solar eclipses coming up here in Texas. So maybe uh, maybe we could cross paths on those because I'll certainly be somewhere around in the the the, the shadowy path of, of these events. Well, very cool. Um, if you guys have any more questions, I don't see any more floating out there. Whoops, my camera has a mind of its own. Um, but uh, we got to let Don go because they all have stuff going on. Um, thank you all very much, Don. Thank you very much. And um, we'll catch you very soon. And I hope you have okay. a good weekend. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll have a hot weekend. But if it's I, I'm planning to set up in my driveway tonight or there tomorrow, you go. depending. Uh, although it's um, uh, something to do with an anniversary and, and uh, my wife may have other plans for me. But Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, that would be. That would be important to keep the peace. Yeah, so, so. yeah, yeah. You, you gotta, you gotta, you can't spend all your time with your eye uh, looking through a telescope. Well, very cool. Well, thank you all for watching. Um, we will be back next week, 10 a.m. Pacific for What's Up for the month um, of September. Holy cow. Um, but thank you all very much, Don. Thank you very much. And uh, have a safe weekend. And we will see you guys next week. Uh, take care. Bye now.